Today, 10 iconic musical pairings. That's the musician and the one effect that in a large part defines their sound. Yeah, we're talking gear today. So uh, be warned, uh, things may get techy. Oh, and there might be demos. Uh, let's go. Hi, uh, Darren here. Yeah, late last year, uh, I listed uh, some of my favorite alt players in a uh, series of videos. Guitarists, bass players, drummers, and finally vocalists. Um, I'll, I'll link to one or other of those up there. Yeah, the core things I kept coming back to to make the case for my choices were taste, ideas, and execution. So with a few examples today, I'm going to hone in on uh, where, you know, those concepts, particularly of taste and ideas, I think, where they take form. And in these cases, I'm going to be looking at, you know, the single piece of gear that I think is integral to creating that sound, you know, the thing that informs their creativity. And do remember, this is a two-way street. Yeah, the sound you get from using a piece of musical gear, you know, the way it colours and influences what you are, how you play, it can be as much an inspiration as it can just a tool. Uh, so on with the list. Uh, but actually, first, a disclaimer. This isn't meant to be, you know, one of those techie guitar guru videos. I'm much more interested, and I hope you are too, uh, in the end product, the music, the sounds. So first up on my list of 10, I've got uh, John McGeoch and the MXR Flanger. Yeah, so John overhauled uh, his sound and his playing style, really, when he joined Susie and the Banshees in 1980 uh, after playing with Magazine for three years. Yeah, he became far less kind of punky and chunky and new wavy and much more picky, uh, more ornate, uh, using kind of swirling, heavily stylized sounds. And an integral part of that sound was shaped by his use of the MXR Flanger. Yeah, it was so much a part of his sound that, um, you know, for live work, at least he, he had it stand mounted. He had it integrated into his mic stand so that he could manipulate the knobs, you know, in real time uh, mid song if need be. So we'll get a bit techy occasionally if I do our flash up a tech warning on the screen, just so you know. Yeah, flange, uh, if you didn't know, is a type of modulation which is very closely related to chorus. The incoming signal is delayed by a very short amount, you know, a few milliseconds, and it's that that movement of this very short delay time that creates that swooshing, swirling, warbling sound that we think of as flange. Yeah, and at this time, you know, flanges were pretty new. I talked in part one of uh, my wire primer about the appearance of some of these new, you know, guitar effects at the end of the 70s. And I think it was this kind of newness that appealed to the post-punk, you know, guitar and bass crowd. You know, they weren't looking to recreate classic rock sounds. They wanted different stuff. They wanted weird, exciting new sounds. And, and flange fits that role perfectly. Yeah, if you want examples, think, you know, classic uh, McGough era Banshee songs, stuff like Israel, uh, Spellbound and Happy House. Yeah, and in fact, here's me attempting that little picky, tricky uh, Happy House riff uh, using a flanger to try and approximate that McGough sound. Yeah, to me, this is the sound of a very specific strand of, you know, gothic post-punk uh, guitar, I guess you'd say. McGough being the prime example of that, but I, I think Robert Smith of The Cure would also be another really good one. So on to number two, and I've got Peter Hook and the Electro Harmonics Clone Theory. So yeah, I guess for Hooky, who was developing that kind of high up, you know, high up the neck bass style from very early on in Joy Division, uh, it made perfect sense, you know, for an element of the band's sound that was so upfront and so melodic. You know, a signature sound. Yeah, it made sense to embellish those sounds, I guess, with some of the latest and the greatest effects that particularly caught his ear. And uh, Hookie found that sound initially in the form of the Electro Harmonics uh, Clone Theory chorus pedal. Yeah, chorus is basically the same as flange, but with slightly longer delay times. You know, generally you're looking at kind of times over about 20 milliseconds. Yet there's less inherent filtering and phase cancellation happening within chorus than there is within flange. And that results in chorus being slightly less kind of in your face, less metallic or, or hollow sounding. Yeah, when Hookie found that sound that he loved so much, that chorus bass sound, uh, he wrote it all the way from Joy Division right through his New Order career. Um, it's pretty much in everything he's ever recorded. Another demo, yeah, here's me having a little go at 24 Hours by Joy Division. I I'm using an Arian stereo chorus here, standing in for the, the clone theory, but they're actually pretty closely related.
Okay, third up, I've got Roland S. Howard and the MXR Blue Box. Yeah, a bit of a legend from, you know, the birthday party, crime in the city solution, uh, these immortal souls plus a ton of solo work. Yeah, uh, he was renowned for his, you know, slashing, spindly, discordant sound uh, and also for the brutally simple setup, uh, the rig he used to get it. Yeah, a Fender Jaguar, um, a pair of MXR effects, that's the Distortion Plus and the Blue Box, uh, into a Fender Twin Reverb Amplifier, and that's it. And the Blue Box is a real oddball. Yeah, it's a mixture of a fuzz and a, a like a double octave drop um, that a lot of people who play it have a hard time getting their, their heads and their hands around. Um, the octave is very, very jumpy and unpredictable. So this, you know, isn't one for control freaks, which might explain exactly why it was that Roland was so, uh, so drawn to it. And another reason is, uh, as is often the case, uh, David Bowie. Yeah, Roland had been a huge fan uh, and he wrote a letter to uh, Adrian Bellew, who was then uh, Bowie's guitarist, um, asking him how he got his live sound. He'd seen the band at their legendary 1978 Melbourne Cricket Ground show. Uh, Bellew replied, he said, yeah, I use the MXR Blue Box and uh, Roland promptly went out and bought himself one. And there you go. That's that taste thing again. You know, you hear something, you love it. And you want part of that for yourself. Uh, you know, it's a story as old as time itself. And fourth up, uh, here's that other pedal I mentioned uh, probably about a minute ago. Yeah, uh, I'm talking about Bob Mould and the MXR Distortion Plus. Uh, and, and like Hookie, this is another one of those, you know, he's had it since day one uh, pedals. Yeah, right through his husker do days, right up to the present day. Although nowadays he uses a, a kind of a slightly swanky uh, boutique clone of the Distortion Plus. Um, but under the hood, it's the same effect. Yeah, the real key to the Distortion Plus sound, uh, and I think the element that, that most obviously contributes a lot to Bob's sound is, is that kick in the high end that it brings in. So, yeah, you get that hard-clipped kind of trebly chainsaw distortion tone here. Yeah, this treble isn't really intentional. It was mostly designed into the circuit, you know, the idea that you get more treble as you get more distortion to cut through those kind of bigger, muddier, woofier, you know, valve amps of the, the, the early in the mid-1970s uh, but in Bob Mould's hands, you know, he was using it with solid state amplifiers or brighter voiced Fender amps, which really brought that kind of signature, you know, that, that blizzard of sharp, kind of fizzy, cutting guitar um, that defined his sound. You know, that kind of, that nosebleed psychedelic punk of Husker Du. Yeah, it really brought that to the fore. Yeah, I myself have owned an MXR Distortion Plus for many years. I, I was a huge Bob Mould fanboy. And although mine's been slightly modded along the way, uh, Here's how it sounds with a little ice cold ice into it. And so moving on from, uh, you know, painful treble and walls of distortion. Um, yeah, I'm only kidding. Yeah, at five, I've got William Reed of the Jesus and Mary Chain with the Shin Ai Fuzzwa. So the Mary Chain were, were really all about marrying that kind of needle into the red, you know, sonic terrorism almost, with kind of Phil Spector-ish bubblegum or surf pop. And I think to really, you know, to really push things over the edge, you need authentic late 60s, early 70s fuzz. You know, you want something trebly, you want it gnarly, dog bothering, you know, it's just square wave madness. Yeah, and that's the Shinai Fuzz Wah for you. Yeah, it's basically the Japanese company's uh, companion fuzz uh, put into a wah pedal enclosure uh, for extra craziness. Yeah, I, I'd love to demo this as I do have a companion fuzz. Uh, unfortunately, it's on long-term uh, loan uh, with a friend, <coughs> Will, um, uh, and uh, we're yet to be reunited. Yeah, the best I can do is a uh, silicon fuzz right clone that I put together. Uh, if, if, if you look there, you should see it a few years back. Um, yeah, it's a really nasty kind of greasy uh, spaghetti western kind of, you know, acid biker movie sound. It gets close, but honestly, it can't really hit the, you know, pure level of sonic evil that a, a companion or a super fuzz can.
Yeah, as you see, it's there, not quite there, though. Uh, you get the idea. Yeah, the Shinai Fuzzwa is the psycho candy sound, really. And in a lot of ways between, you know, Bob Mould, our previous entry, uh, William Reed, and the next guitarist on the list, um, we'll have pretty much covered the whole spectrum of, you know, guitar noise, guitar heroes that influenced the first generation of shoegaze bands. And that next guitarist is, at number six, Jay Maskis and his Electroharmonics Big Muff. Yeah, Bob, uh, William and Jay, the official ambassadors of Tinnitus for an entire generation, myself included. Yeah, and the Electro Harmonics Big Muff. Yeah, it's a dreadful name, really. But, you know, that guy heavy guitar culture allows it to persist and there doesn't seem to be any clamour to, to change that. But I digress. Anyway, yeah, if you're not au fait with the Big Muff as a fuzz pedal, you, you'll have probably heard the name as part of the title of Mudhoney's uh, Super Fuzz Big Muff LP. Yeah, originally uh, a very late 60s uh, transistor-based distortion fuzz pedal, which has been used by everyone from Jay uh, to David Gilmore of Pink Floyd um, to Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins to, uh, and get this, yeah, the Carpenters. Yeah, it's the fuzz tone in Goodbye to Love. And it's one of those effects which has been subject to, you know, constant revisions and versions over the years. You get the triangle, the Russian, the bass, the op amp, the Civil War, yeah, the list goes on. Yeah, Jay's favourite is the uh, early to mid 70s Ram's head version of the Big Muff. But uh, let's not get too picky. Um, I mean, just check out his cabinet of Big Muffs here. Um, I, I think he might have a problem. So the Big Muff sound is kind of thicker and smoother than some other fuzzes, but, but it's got a raspy edge, uh, which you can dial out with the tone control if you need to. Yeah, they've become one of the most, you know, uh, ubiquitous, if you like, alt fuzz choices since the advent of grunge. So whether you know it or not, you will have heard of Big Muff. Uh, somewhere along the line. Yeah, Jay plays his absolutely maxed uh, through multiple cranked uh, marshals at teeth loosening volume. I can't manage that, I'm afraid, here in my bedroom. Uh, but here's a snatch of Freak Scene uh, through my Big Muff, which happens to be a Solvetech Deluxe version. Thick, thick, thick sustain. Um, you know, Jay uses a big muff pretty much everywhere on rhythm guitar, on his solos. Uh, he probably brushes his teeth with one. It's just his thing. And um, yeah, if you do play guitar, there's a quite high probability it'll be your thing too. Yeah, in guitar circles, you cannot escape the big muff sound. Uh, I know uh, because I've tried. Um, but someone who, as far as I know, has never knowingly used a big muff is next up in the list. And that is at number seven. Uh, Steve Albini and the Intersound IVP preamp. Yeah, and here we're moving out of the realm of little, you know, metal boxes with, uh, you know, clicky clacky little foot switches into, you know, the world of studio or rack gear. But, but, but time out. Yeah, first, there are people out there who will be shrieking, ah, oh, harmonic percolator, the minute they hear Steve's name. Uh, yes, this is the other cult drive or distortion box associated with Steve. Um, but crucially, I think uh, it's only a really quite small part of Steve's sound. Uh, he just uses it for the you know, extra noisy sections of songs. The key part of the tone that really is all his comes from the IVP. Uh, and how do you describe that tone? Yeah, it's very steely, metallic, present, uncompressed, clangy, clanky, uh, really aggressive attack with a kind of a high mid treble focus. Utterly unmistakable uh, and uniquely uh, all Steve sound. Uh, the IVP is a rack mounted preamp designed to kind of amplify and shape, you know, to EQ the signal before bringing it up to stage volume via a power amp and a set of speakers. And it's that control over the frequency bands, you know, that tweakable four stage EQ that it has the, that really, I think, is the key to the Albini uh, foundation tone, if you like. And yeah, his other gear does contribute to that, you know, the aluminium neck guitars, uh, the wide range frequency cabs he uses. They all contribute, but the IVP is a very, very big part of that. And while we're talking about Steve, uh, let's just quickly check in at the gear page and see if his uh, Steely Dan hot take is still playing. Uh, yep, yep, 40 pages and counting. Yep, go Steve. So eighth on the list. Yeah, uh, and here I'm going away from a, you know, a unique guitarist like, like Steve is to something a little more ephemeral, less specific, dreamy even. Yeah, this is the only non-specific entry I've allowed myself in this list. It's uh, Shoegaze. 
and the Yamaha FX500. Yeah, this is a slight detour, if you like, from the driving idea behind this list, but it just happens to be a piece of gear, you know, another rack or a board unit, you know, uh, along with a, a very similar one called the SPX90, which is responsible not just for, you know, one player's signature tone, but also in many ways, you know, an entire genre. Yeah, Shoegaze uses a lot of layered effects to create those big soundscapes. And, you know, the first generation Shoegaze acts, they either had to go old school, you know, big pedal boards, lots of whatever affordable effects they could manage, usually boss stuff, you know, that kind of thing. Or they could try and integrate one of the newer kind of outboard rack digital multi effects units. Yeah, one I mentioned was the SPX90, that, that happens to be home to the kind of reverse reverb and the early reflection reverb presets that. Uh, became just a huge integral part of Kevin Shields, my bloody Valentine, you know, that glide sound of his. But the big one for me was the FX500. Um, this one was home to a very famous preset called uh, Soft Focus, or as it came to be known, uh, Slow Dive in a Box. Yeah, Soft Focus has been uh, seeing a bit of a revival of late. Um, Catlin Bread, the uh, pedal manufacturer, have created a standalone pedal version of, of the Soft Focus algorithm, if you like for, you know, a new generation of uh, shoegaze practitioners who are out there. But that aside, lots of people have had a go at, you know, combining the separate effects which are present in Soft Focus uh, using traditional uh, pedals to see if they can get close. Yeah, here's my attempt. I'm using a hall reverb into a kind of a subtle octave up, uh, into a multi-tap delay, and then some chorus and detuning applied at the end. Um, yeah, it sounds something like this. Yeah, not bad, I think. I'm almost there. And whilst we're still in the, you know, the world of outboard rack gear, and I just mentioned multi-tap delay, we'll move on to number nine in my list, and that is Johnny Greenwood and the Roland RE201 Space Echo. Yeah, uh, Johnny started using this beast on the uh, the Benz album, but it's probably heard uh, most prominently all over OK Computer. Yeah, it's right there in Airbag, a uh, subterranean homesick alien uh, climbing up the walls. The Space Echo is a multi-head uh, tape echo machine allowing multiple copies of the input signal to be delayed by differing amounts you know it could either be stretched down to the very moody atmospheric echoes or kept tighter for shorter kind of reverb like sounds yeah it's had a long history of being known as a great studio tool much beloved of dub recording artists and uh it's become synonymous, if you like, with Johnny Greenwood over over the years. Yeah, Radiohead do even take them out on the road for live shows, which is uh, either very brave or very foolhardy, being as at heart they're you know completely mechanical devices relying on correctly aligned set of tape heads and a you know a little thin loop of circulating magnetic tape. But it's testament, I guess, to you know the distinct qualities that you know analog delay technology does impart to the final sound. You know, it it can be simulated. But for true connoisseurs, you know, uh, you go tape or you go home. All this talk of looping uh, leads me on to the final pairing on this list. At number 10, I've got Ian Williams and the Akai Headrush E1. Yeah, on the surface, this is a delay that, you know, fakes a tape delay type sound. You know, it, it has some of that tape style degradation as the loops repeat. But its real selling point at the time was its ability to loop stuff in a live context. Yeah, for the time, this gave you a whopping 12 seconds with overdubs um, in glorious 16-bit sampled format. Yeah, this was released about 98, 99, thereabouts. Uh, there were other pedals that were out at the same time that did allow for some live looping. Stuff like the Boomerang, the phrase sampler, uh, some of the boss units, the Line 6 DL4, I think, had it too. But the Akai was just so simple to use and fairly bomb-proof. Um, yeah, here's mine over here. Yeah, I owned and played one of these back in the day. And bomb proof is clearly a bit of an exaggeration as, uh, well, mine doesn't really work anymore. Um, hence why there's no demo for this one. Yeah, there were some quite high profile users of the Headrush uh, circa the pedals release. Uh, Johnny Greenwood, again, he used it exclusively for looping. He didn't use the delay at all. And uh, Katie Tunstall made a bit of a splash uh, using one on a live performance on, you know, Jules Holland's later uh, music program uh, back in around about 2000. Yeah, I think, but for sheer kind of dizzying invention and, you know, a sneak peek into the future, if you like, uh, Ian Williams of uh, Don Caballero. Um, yeah, I did mention him in my guitarist list. He showed how it was done. Yeah, you should see here a clip of Ian using two Akai Headrush pedals at the same time uh, for a Don Cab live show, circa around about the year 2000. 
Yeah, he was uh, looping loops and overdubbing overdubs and doing it all live. Uh, it's very impressive. Yeah, this came about because founding guitarist Mike Banfield had left in about 98, leaving you know, Ian Williams as the band's only guitarist. So uh, he chose to use a couple of looping pedals live to try and fill that void. Yeah, the head rush was, uh, or it became certainly a pretty common component of a lot of guitarists' boards who were doing you know, post-rock or math rock during this period. As I said, it was relatively cheap. It doubled as a pretty great delay. And it was hands down the most easy to use of all the looping pedals that were available at that time. Yeah, Ian has, of course, gone on to even more complex, you know, loop and sample based music uh, in his latest band, Battles. But wherever the technology's taken us, uh, it was for many, uh, for me included, I think, the, the head rush that really kicked off the era of affordable, user-friendly live looping. And there you go, 10 uh, signature pairings, I guess. Um, I'm hoping this has been interesting enough for all the non-musicians out there. Uh, we'll see, I guess. It is quite hard to pitch this stuff, as it's easy to kind of tip over into that kind of, you know, gear demo nerd territory. And I'm really trying to sidestep that here. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. Uh, and please don't hold back. As usual, uh, if you've got this far, thanks very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, please think about subscribing. And yeah, if you do like the video, give it a like down below because it really helps me and the rest of the videos on the channel reach a much wider audience. Okay, and that's it for today. Yeah, um, hope to see you all soon. Take care. Bye for now.